we went ahead and started fabricating it down at their plant here in, north of the airport. They assigned like three or four guys to work with me on this piece. And after, after being down there for a week or so, the shop steward, his union shop, went to management and said, this guy's not union, he's, he's working in here, he can't be working in here. The owner of the company took him back out and he said, you see this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy's paying their wages. You have a problem with that? <laughs> and the guy said, well, no, I guess not. What's the Belgian one? Um, Fat tire? No. We're talking beers here. <laughs> We're thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have a beer to have out of yes, our podcast? Yeah, I may have to do that Why sometime. Not? Well, I think. Well, it, I thought you were serious. No, I know. I, I know you thought I was serious, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> but it would be very tasty. I don't know if, how good I would be as a podcast host if I. Who cares? You know, uh, you well, the talking. people who listen to it or watch this might care. <laughs> yeah, who cares, right? Fred Borchard. I have Fred Borchard here today, who I'm a huge fan of your work as well as I represent you. I'm fortunate to be able to say that. And for those people who are happen to be watching this on YouTube, you can actually see one of his sculptures on the side. That's out of the old oak tree, right? No, that, that, that not, piece is mahogany. That was mahogany? Yeah. Oh, that was, piece was done right when I got into back to Tucson in 1970. Uh, oh, wow. That's a great piece. We'll talk about it, but not now. Okay. I want to find out a little bit about you because I know some of your background, clearly, because I've known you for a long time personally and as an artist. But where'd you grow up? Was it Chicago? or I grew up in the, in the suburb of Chicago called Wilmette. It's um, in the North Shore of, of uh, Chicago area. And uh, I know you got a brother for sure. Born and raised there. Had three brothers. Uh-huh. And uh, where do you fall in the pecking I'm order? A, I'm the second oldest. So you've got three brothers, and you're the second. And how you got sisters too? No sisters. Yeah, just three brothers. Only only one of my brothers is still alive. Yeah, the one I know clearly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and he's your younger brother. He's the youngest. Yeah. yeah. And so, what did your dad and mom do? My dad was a. Uh, my mom was a school teacher originally, uh -huh. and uh, and my dad was a. Uh, engineer and then a test pilot during world war ii for bell aircraft wow what was that like yeah well he got killed flying testing wow in 1944 testing a a uh it was a b63d it was a one of one model version then it was the only one ever made he he got he crashed in, in it in uh niagara falls new york where the bell was Hmm. So he was he was testing this new plane. He was it was a, a modification plane. of an existing plane. And this was yeah. 1944, Four. so during the war. Yeah, March. And was 40. he in the was he in the military doing this? No, he, he was, was a, a, under a military contract. He was too old to be a fighter pilot. But, uh -huh. uh, he had been a pilot for a long time. Was a barnstormer and had his own planes and all that <laughs> when we were kids and uh, when I was very young. But uh, so he, I was only. Four and a half, five years old when he was killed. So. Uh, do you remember that? Vaguely. Yeah. And your 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 other brother, who's passed, I guess he would have been affected more. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but he was a barnstormer, so he did the things where you would go and do the well, he just wean walking and all that. No, kind he of didn't. Stuff, do, or, he didn't do that sort of stuff. But he, you know, had a biplane and would fly around and and. Uh, uh, land on the ice of the, on the lake in Wisconsin where mm -hmm. my grandmother's home was and stuff like that. And so how did your mom take that, losing? She's got three little kids, right? Four. Well, she was pregnant with my youngest brother when my dad was killed. Oh, my. So, yeah, she was uh, she was tough. I bet. She was, she was a wonderful mother and raised all four of us. And, and worked the whole time as well? No, she she pretty much just raised us. I had a, a grandfather who was uh, quite wealthy and supported us. And uh, so, did he kind of fill in for the role as your father? No, he was much older. Uh huh. Uh, but uh, some of my some of my dad's friends, pilots, uh, kind of nurtured us to some mm -hmm. extent. We used to go flying with them and stuff. And so, did you have a love or a hate with flying? 
Um, or a little of both. No, I, it never, I was always careful who I flew with. And I've flown a lot, but mm -hmm. only, only with the uh, old pilots, not the bold pilots. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I watched a plane go down once in front of me at an air show, F-18, when I was in the military. and that. Yeah, I saw one crash. Yeah, it makes you Naval feel. Naval Air Station. Wh where was it? Which one? Glenview Naval Air Station yeah. outside of Chicago. Yeah, it changes the way you see and in feel things, show. doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Larry Cancelor, I don't know if you know Larry, but Larry was on and he used to do those air shows too. Mm -hmm. He was the an announcer and uh, he's a musician and an artist. And, and we talked about that as well for those people who are really interested in pilots. So you grow up without a dad, but some of these pilots, dads, pilot, your, your father's friends filled in a bit. Mm -hmm. And um, did you early on have this sense of art and loving art? Uh, yeah, when I was uh, in first grade, I, I, as a kid, I was always drawing, and, and we had a, 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 a tray with plasticine modeling clay, and I was always making stuff. And uh, when I was in first grade, the um, an outfit that did educational films called Coronet Films uh, came to the school, grade school, when I was in first grade, and they had me and three other students go and uh, go to their studios and make art while they were making movies of teaching teachers how to teach art. Hmm. And uh, so we would draw and paint and stuff like that. And had you been selected by the teacher as one of the people that should go? No, and do this? I think I think I think it was selected because they looked at a lot of the kids' arts and they said, "Well, I'll take him and take him and whatever." And uh, when I when I did that, I had to get a social security number to get paid. <laughs> so my social security card for many years said Freddie Borchard <laughs> rather than Frederick Borchard. Oh, uh, that's fine because you went by Freddie at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, it was Freddie. You know, and that was your well, six years old or something. Six years old, redheaded kid. Yeah. Uh -huh. And did you feel like you were an artist from that point on? No. No, I just like to make art. I I never I never considered myself. I never really thought about being an artist. Until I was in grad or in, in college, so but you made art the whole time. The whole time you you yeah. were and and it was both drawing and modeling or mainly more sculptural kind of stuff. Uh, drawing, carving. Yeah. And of course, I made model airplanes like all the kids in those uh -huh. days did. Where we and, had bought a kit and it was two blocks of wood and, and, uh -huh. a, and a design. And were you a good student in school? Not particular. I always got A's in art. <laughs> but uh, in the rest, I was just kind of mediocre. Yeah, that seems to be the pattern, I think, for a lot of artists. In fact, a lot of them do not so well in school at all, except art. Yeah. And they all excel in that field. Mm -hmm. And so did you have a sense? What year did you graduate high school? When was that? 57. 57. So we I took one art class in high school and dropped off after a couple of days because I didn't want to be making posters for sock hops and stuff like that. <laughs> But I did all, you know, I took the college prep kind of uh, program for high school. Uh -huh. But all my electives, I took drafting and machine shop and wood shop and, and automotives and metal shop and all those. So I knew how to do all of that stuff. I mean, well, a lot of it I knew anyways, but, but I learned to weld and to forge and to. Before you even got out of high school, you did. Yeah. And did you think you were going to use that as more of a trade when you got out, possibly? Or no, you just I just liked it. I just liked to make yeah, stuff. You do. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense if you see your sculptures. Yeah. I mean, they're, and I remember going to your house and your forge and things and saying, yeah. I mean, it's like a heavy machinery yeah. kind of setup. Um, loud, hot, takes a lot of strength. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. So when you go graduate from high school, in 57 mm -hmm. where did you go to came college? to the university here in tucson At university and just started off as a liberal arts student how why tucson how in the world did you end up in well, tucson from chicago when i was a kid uh, because i had lost my father my mother always tried to send us to summer camp mm -hmm. so we'd be around men and uh so i went to summer camp in wisconsin a couple of years starting when i was six and then uh came to a camp in northern Arizona uh, at a place called Stoneman Lake, which was like a ranch camp. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, It was very small. It was only like 
30 kids. We lived in three big army tents and, and uh, did cowboy stuff. You know, we had horses. And mm -hmm. That's basically everything revolved around having horses or hiking in the mountains or what hiking the Grand Canyon, climbing the San Francisco peaks. And would you do this for like an entire summer or? Yeah. It was just, for like three get on months? Santa Fe and Chicago. Yeah. Two uh, months, you know, yeah. eight weeks. And uh, just, you know, it was a glorious time. And you could do that, right? You were young, right? You were yeah. eight or nine and they yeah, put you on the eight, train? Yeah. By yeah. yourself, right? Yeah, with, with several other kids from yeah. the Midwest. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we had a great time. Yeah, and then you'd, get, you'd show up here in Flagstaff, Flagstaff and somebody would pick you up. Pick us up in the and back you... of a truck and we'd go to the <laughs> ranch. And, yeah, we had trunks like in bed rolls and stuff. And, mm -hmm. Then we'd spend the summer there. And, and so, doing cowboy stuff, basically. Yeah. And you, how many years did you do that? How many summers? We did that for five five years. I think the last time was when I was like from nine to 14. And did you have an, an immediate affinity for the West, do you think? Yeah, I had some family that had ranched or were ranching. I had an aunt and uncle that had a ranch in, between Sholo and Springerville and another uncle that had a ranch outside of Tucson. Mm. And another uncle that had a ranch in Montana, and, uh, and these were real ranches. They were they yeah, raised cattle ranch, and stuff. Working, working ranches, ranches yeah. yeah. And did you ever go work out on any of those? Do any of those? Uh, some, yeah. Did you Not like too it? Much. It's yeah, yeah, hard work. No, no, I branded and all that. Uh -huh. stuff. I never was much for roping because being left-handed, they always taught you to right-handed, and it was, it was always <laughs> ass backwards. <laughs> Trying to learn it, and I never really practiced that much. I didn't have that much use to be a roper. So you thought, well, I'm going to come back to Arizona. I'm going to go to the University of Arizona Well, versus Flag. I always had an affinity for the West, the open spaces and the independence and the light and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in high school, I, I worked one summer in Yellowstone at uh, Canyon Hotel. Mm, wow, that must have been fantastic. Yeah, it was. It was in the, in the mid-50s. and. Uh, I tried to get that same job in college, and they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> oh, well, when I was in high school. I lied yeah. about my age. To actually yeah. get in. You had to be 15. I was 14. But uh, uh, What were you doing, like busing and that kind no, of stuff? No, I was or? a houseman. I, I did all the heavy work for the maids in the hotels, uh -huh. vacuumed like, the halls and hauled laundry. and That's hard that work, sort, isn't it? Sort of stuff. I was, it was all right. The food was terrible, and the pay was terrible, but... But you were in Yellowstone. But I was in Yellowstone, yeah. So all, all the days off, we'd go and explore and see. I saw some great stuff. I, I bet. saw some fountains that only, or geysers that only went off one or two times a year that were five times bigger than Old Faithful. Uh -huh. Just happened to be in the right place at the right time and watch the sucker go off. And uh -huh. It was like a bomb. Have you ever gone back to Yellowstone since Yeah, then? I've been back several yeah. times. Do you still feel that nostalgia from when you were a kid? Um, I wouldn't call it a nostalgia. I would call it more an affinity mm -hmm. to to, to the place. west, to mountains, to yeah. canyons. To yeah, I was I had a real nice feeling about the, the smells and the lights and the feeling of the space and all that. Yeah, the rocks. Yeah. Well, you've always had an affinity, I think. For I mean, at least in your sculpture, rocks and stone natural material natural yeah. material for yeah. sure 100 percent. now that makes more sense to hearing this backstory of why mm -hmm. one of the reasons why you'd be so drawn to that type of material and so tucson had something that called you more than flag just the desert the university it was just a better better was well it? i guess nau was was there at the time yeah I, you know it was the, you know i was thinking of College prep. I didn't know what I was going to do when I when I was a freshman in college. No idea what you wanted to be in. Not a clue. Yeah. But I knew that I liked visual arts stuff, and so I I, I changed my major at the end of my freshman year to uh, uh, advertising. Mm. You know, doing lettering and and commercial Be art because that that was something you could see as well, actually making a living. Out. Commercial art, yeah. <clears throat> it seemed to be a, a practical thing. Uh, I had a grandmother who was a sculptor's, 
and uh, went to the School of the Art Institute where I ended up in graduate school mm -hmm. in Chicago years ago. And I have a couple of busts that she modeled, you know, of great grandmothers and stuff. But, mm -hmm. uh, was that she, she? She was my 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 father's grandmother. Grandmother. Your father's grandmother. So she yeah. was in the eighteen hundreds time frame. Correct, or around the turn of the century. She was. Yeah. What was her name? Do you remember? Her name was. Um, I can't think of. No, I'm putting you on the spot, but I thought it'd be interesting to look her up as, as far as see if her sculptures ever come up for sale or any of that kind of thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Did she make a living as a sculptor? No. no. But she did that. She, she was, was a student, and my grandfather was a photographer. Uh huh. Oh, wow. And uh, he, uh, he had a regular photography business in Chicago. Mm hmm. And I think, you know, in those days, 1890s, there weren't many women sculptors who were mm -mm. professional. Mm -mm. There weren't many women professional artists, period. Yeah. You know? And uh, that would have been a, a very rare. So, yeah, I have an album of it that my grandfather made of the of the Chicago Exposition, the World's Fair in Chicago. 1893. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, pho photos that he, I guess, made these albums and then sold them from his ship. Chicago shop downtown. And so he would go out and he was doing photography and lithography? No, just photography. Just photography. Yeah. And so he took photos of the White City in 1893. Correct. And um, he would sell them probably at the World's Fair, maybe? I guess. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I'd like to see one of those, actually. What were some of the photos that were in there? All the buildings and yeah. the sculptures and the yeah, inside it, the halls and you know the standard kind of stuff. Yeah, because a lot of that didn't last very long. It was gone no, pretty yeah, quickly, and part down. of it burned down, and part of it well, was torn down. Well, a lot of down. it was plaster. It yeah, wasn't even yeah, stone. No. Yeah, those would be very well, interesting. To... The Field Museum is still there, and a few other buildings. I'll give you. I'll give you some trivia. Eighteen ninety-three. Here's all the things that were the first in eighteen ninety-three: zippers, shredded <laughs> wheat. Juicy fruit gum, uh, shredded wheat. When, shredded wheat. When I when I was uh, that was when it first when came when out. Was, when I was living in uh, Niagara Falls mm -hmm. during the war, when my father was a test pilot, the shredded wheat factory was about three blocks away. And <laughs> you, you could smell it all the time. It came in the World's Fair. Yeah. Same with Pabst Blue Ribbon, mm -hmm. and the first time they showed the electric chair, all those were first. Okay. It'd be interesting to see if he took a picture of the electric chair in those photos. I don't think I bet so. He, it wouldn't surprise me if he did. I'm going to look at it though. We're going to. I want to. You're going to have to bring one of those up. I want to see yeah. it. And so, you uh, you come to U of A. You change. You go into a marketing degree. Commercial art. Commercial art. Yeah. And and did you get that degree? No. Yeah, okay. After after a, after a semester, a year in commercial art. That summer, my mother's college roommate was married to a guy who was the president of the Gibson Card Company mm -hmm. outside of Cincinnati. And he said, why don't you come down and I'll show you around and you can get an idea of what, what commercial arts are like. So I went down and visited them and went to the factory, the studios, mm -hmm. and went in this huge room where there was all these people in rows <laughs> sitting at drafting tables or drawing tables. Right. And one person was making flowers, one person was right. making hummingbirds, and one person was making bees. And I thought, there's no way that I would huh. ever do this. Huh. So when I went back to uh, the university in the fall, mm -hmm. I changed my major again to fine arts, not having a, not having a clue. What what I wanted to do, but I knew what I didn't want to do. Right, drawing hummingbirds over and over and over eight hours a day didn't no. seem like that was no. so. That's your sophomore year or your junior, junior year. Junior year, I changed to uh, fine arts, fine arts painting, mm -hmm. and uh, and I had painted before that. Um, in fact, I took a a summer class at Northwestern University in a painting class when I had to take an English class to make up. And I had to take two classes in order to register, so I took a painting class, and, and I did real well in that. And that was in high school? No, this was uh, after my freshman year. I see. The university. You went back for summer or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, it was just a summer class at mm -hmm. Northwestern University, which was just down the road, not too far from where I lived in Wilmette. 
And that was painting, a painting class? Yeah. Yeah. So, And did you find that exciting when you took that? Uh, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't... I never got really excited about making art as far as a gut kind of thing until I started making sculpture. And then I, mm. I really felt that I had found what I wanted to, what I, what I needed to be. Yeah. And so at the U of A, this is like your junior year, you're now in the fine yeah. arts department. That's like 1959, 60 time frame. 59. So. Yeah. I graduated in 61. So yeah. 60, 61 would be my senior yeah. year. Yeah. And or so, no, wait, 57. 60. Yeah. So 1960. So you're making, uh, you're primarily painting and you haven't taken yes. your first sculpture class yet or have you? I took one sculpture class and it was so rinky dink <laughs> that I was way ahead of it with my own welding. And yeah. What you like could that. do already. Were uh, you making art, any sculpture art at that time? Uh, more practical kinds of things, you know, welding up stuff and, and doing car stuff too, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but uh, I think I was doing a little bit of, of uh, sculpture, just welded wire things. And Were you familiar? Did you know who David Smith was yet at that oh, point in sure. time? Yeah. At that point, you did. Oh, yeah. And it was as soon that... as I as soon as I started uh, as a as a fine arts major, I was taking art history classes and stuff, which was interesting. In that, having been a liberal arts student, I took a lot of the basic classes. The, I covered those the first couple of years. So when I got to be a junior, I didn't have to take a science or a language or anything. I had already done all that. Mm -hmm. So I could really focus on on uh, the art classes, which, you know, was great. And were you starting to get serious at this point by your junior, you think? No, I think I was still pretty much bewildered. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really until I... Well, I graduated, when I graduated from the university, I had a painting teacher there who was quite well known at the time and had a reputation. And he would, uh, at the end of my senior year, he he would take and critique all your work. Mm -hmm. One at a time, you'd go out in the hallway and he'd talk to you and right. show your work and stuff like that. He, he, he critiqued my work and he said, you know, well, I'm going to give you an A. I think you're really a good painter, but do me a favor. Never be a painter. So I thought, well, that was kind of contradictory, but whatever. So I was painting a lot of three-dimensional stuff. I see. And uh, so I didn't know what to do. Uh, yeah, why did he say that? That's an odd thing. I don't know. I never did quite figure it out why he said that. Do you remember his name? Yeah, it was Scott. That was his last name? Yeah. Scott. And so he said, you you get an A in the class, but don't be a painter. Yeah. And that's your graduation. That's when you graduate. Yeah, right. right. So so what do you do? From, so I How decided, do you take that? Well, I better, I better figure out more about this. So I decided. To, <laughs> and you're young. You're what, 21 yeah, or so, probably. Yeah. So I decided to apply to graduate school at the Art Institute in Chicago, uh -huh. which I knew was a really good art school, and uh, and see where it led me. And so I, I uh, went down to the Art Institute and applied and got accepted. And uh, started off as a painter. And uh, at that time, graduate school, well, the Art Institute was very kind of traditional in that you went to school from nine to five, mm -hmm. five days a week. Everybody took drawing. You were required to always have a drawing class in your in your schedule, mm -hmm. and uh, so I took drawing and art history and, and painting. And uh, after my first semester, oh, I took a sculpture class there and and met a guy who was teaching sculpture, who became my mentor and advisor. And uh, I just really, really got excited about making sculpture. And what was his name? His name was Eldon Danhausen. And uh, many years later, I endowed a scholarship at the Art Institute in his name. Hmm. But uh, He was that instrumental in you really finding absolutely. your path? Why absolutely. was that? What did he do that was so... Uh, 
groundbreaking. Well, for he you. at at first he just nurtured me and showed me how to, to do a lot of stuff that I wanted to try to do. And uh, and I also he I think he recognized that I had a lot of talent and technical ability to to do what I was wanting to do. And anyway, after after one semester of painting, I went to my graduate committee when you you know you had a review a couple times a year. I said I'd like to change my major to sculpture. And they said, we can't do that. And I said, well, I guess I can. I'm going to go someplace else to do it. Right. But they said, well, okay, we'll do it on a provisional basis. You change your, change your major to sculpture. And uh, so then I just really dove into it. Mm. Uh, stopped. I still had to take drawing classes and history classes. But in the, at that time, I guess it still is a master's degree in fine arts. It was two years. Mm-hmm. And it's all pretty much studio in some some classroom. And that's what you did, two years? So I did two years at the Art Institute in sculpture and did really well. And uh, was really producing stuff and, and getting great grades. And and, uh, and it was the same kind of organic kind of sensibility, more along a David Smith kind of well, type. Well, you've got my book. There's yeah. some of those, some of the early stuff. Yes. A lot of it was exp- 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 experimental yes trying different things yeah you know fabricated i did leather and i did wood stone a lot of metal fabrication and some casting and just you know trying everything to see what what you were searching for who you were exactly yeah still am yeah (laughs) well i think good artists are right they're always looking yeah and i know you are i mean i can see that the things you do well are always a little different what i'm doing now 60 years later is kind of going back and looking at some of the things I did way back then and mm. and saying, thinking to myself, well, I did this. What if I had done that? Mm. And so kind of looking looking up the avenues that I didn't take mm. or the alleys or whatever. Yeah, Meryl Mahaffey's yeah. doing the same thing. Yeah. And I think Ed Mel, to some extent, has done a little yeah. bit of that as well. Yeah. And so, so I think when you get in your 70s and your 80s, you start – reflecting back upon what you did and why you did it and how you did it and mm-hmm. what you didn't do. And maybe what you still want to do. And what you could still can do, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you graduate with so, your MFA in a couple of years, about 64. Yeah, at that time, well, they still have a, a similar program. The Art Institute had what they called a fellowship program. Hmm. And anybody who was a student at the Art Institute could compete in it. And uh, you had to be graduating either with a with a certificate or a, a bachelor's or a master's degree. And what you did was you presented, you were given a space in a hallway or a classroom or something, and you presented uh, a body of your previous work as well as studies towards a major work, whether it be in ceramics or dressmaking or fashion or sculpture or mm-hmm. painting or whatever. And at that time they had a theme Every year now they don't they don't do that anymore. But the theme of that year was um, it was Shakespeare's four hundredth birthday, so it had to be something about Shakespeare. So everybody went out and brought the classic comics on Shakespeare, you know, looking mm-hmm. for something to to uh, do inspire and, them. Well, no, something to to tie their their what their their current work mm-hmm. to try and make it look like some kind of relation to Shakespeare. It was kind of bullshit that they had that kind of a thing. But anyways, so at that time I was doing uh, see these uh, big steel sculptures made out of uh, plowshares and mow boards mm-hmm. that I had found in farm junkyards, big curved shapes and sharp angry things. And, and uh, so I had several models of that. And, and then I made models and drawings leading up to this major piece. And then I made the piece. Well, what you did is there was two stages to the fellowship competition. Everybody that entered was in the first stage. And then you presented this portfolio, visual portfolio of past work and what you were proposing to do for mm-hmm. a major piece. And then the faculty, the whole faculty of the school went and juried it and picked like 40 students to go into the finals. 
And the, the finals, there was like 10 fellowships ranging from from like 1000 to three or $4,000. Uh, the only stipulation on them was that they had to, originally had to be spent outside the United States. Hmm. And the idea was to get people to go to Paris and London and mm-hmm. study, but uh, they weren't they weren't really uh, making that a firm thing. You could go to New York to be a painter or whatever. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> anyway, um, so I made this big steel sculpture. And uh, at the same time, every two years, the Art Institute of Chicago had an exhibition that was called the Chicago Show, Chicago and Vicinity Show. Anybody within 75 miles of Chicago, an artist, could enter this show, and it was juried by by uh, art professionals from you know New York or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, name artists and things like that. And so I had done a wood carving, and I entered it into into the Chicago show, and getting getting accepted as a as a uh, student was was a big deal. Mm-hmm. So I got accepted, so I was really happy about that. So I had this this. Wood carving, vertical wood carving called uh, American Way. What was it? What was the imagery? It's in the book. Can you describe it though? Well, it's kind of totem like, uh, uh-huh. mechanical kinds of shapes and a screw kind of thing. And, okay. And uh, blocks. And then it was on a steel column in the base. Was that like 63 time frame? Yeah, 60. Like that. Yeah, right in there. Anyway. Um, at the same time, I was doing this fellowship thing. I mean, I was going five different directions, uh-huh. trying to keep up. And uh, I got accepted in the Chicago show, and then it opened, and I won the premier prize in sculptures. Wow. It blew me away. The, uh, I think it was called the Pauline Palmer Prize in Sculpture. It was $1,000, mm-hmm. which was a... Big deal and got a lot of media and stuff. I'm like sure. That. And then a couple of weeks later, right when I graduated, I won the the uh, the uh, sculptures fellowship from the Art Institute, mm. the traveling fellowship. So I was really riding high. That was like three grand or something. Yeah. Yeah. So and uh, and then on top of the, all of that, about six weeks before I graduated. One of the uh, sculpture teachers, a woman who was teaching 3D design, figure modeling, I think, got uh, got really ill and couldn't teach. And the dean came to me and said, could you cover this class? And I'd never thought about teaching. But, mm-hmm. but uh, I said, yeah, sure, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> so I was teaching this 3D design class for this for this gal. and. There was, she didn't have any notes or anything that she left me. I just was, went in the classroom and, uh, you know, I kind of asked the students, what what have you been doing? Right. You know, or and what then, haven't you And you, you were been teaching doing? this during your MFA? Yeah, and yeah. I'm still working in the on the fellowship piece and. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, you were busy. Yeah, going to, going to class and all that. So uh, I went to my, to my major professor, Eldon, Danhausen and said, you know, what do I do? He was the head of the sculpture department. He mm-hmm. said, well, he, we sat down in his in his uh, kitchen one day and he wrote out a, a uh, kind of a class program for the last six movies. So I went and followed that and did it. And mm-hmm. evidently it was okay because then I graduated and everything. And right after I graduated, the dean came to me and he said, would you like to teach sculpture here next year? <laughs> and I thought, let's see, sculpture at the Art Institute, Vietnam. Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll go. To, I think I'll stay here and teach. Yeah, because that was so. That was sixty four. Yeah. And so Nam was really just starting, starting to, yeah, to to to. And I had go been, on. been to the draft thing and all that, and and I had a being a graduate school, I had a, a, a deferment, mm. but that was after I graduated. But the deferment went away. Was, was going to go away. So um, I said, yeah. Of course, I'll sign up and, uh, and get paid. Yeah, right. So um, I started off teaching three-dimensional design at the Art Institute. 
<laughs> and, and you uh, weren't very old either, right? No. Like 23 or 4? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. And so how long did you teach that? I taught there for five years. Wow. And long time. The reason, well, at the end of I had to I had to use that traveling fellowship with five years or lose it. Mm. So at the end of the five fifth teaching year, I I quit and bought an open ticket to uh, Sydney, Australia. And you weren't afraid you would get picked back up by the draft and go to Vietnam? No, I wrote a letter to my draft board. And said, you know, I had I had been teaching these five years, and I had won this fellowship to go and study oceanic and, and primitive art in Australia. Uh, will that qualify me for a deferment? Mm -hmm. Look back, yes, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and that's like sixty nine or seventy. You know, this was in 60, 66, 67. Because you graduate. Well, I taught when I was still, let's yeah. see, so I taught. Probably 68, I, I would remember. think. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so I got this open ticket. In those days, with an open ticket to Australia, as long as I was moving west, mm -hmm. it was valid. Mm -hmm. So I went all across the South Pacific zigzagging. Right. Sometimes <laughs> only places. going west, you know, 50 miles. Right. But going north 500 or something. So I went to... Uh, to uh, Tahiti, the Society Islands. And I went to American Samoa, Pango Pango, Western Samoa, Apia, Lukalofa Tonga, Fiji, um, New Caledonia, New Zealand, and finally went and ended up in Australia and mm. then made a big loop in Australia, went out to the outback and Alice Springs all the way around, went, visited the museums and things. There wasn't a whole lot of contemporary art going on in Australia in those days. Well, what was the most interesting island that you went to as far as just the either the experience or the art or the remoteness? Because that's, you know, 68, yeah, There wasn't 69. that much. Well, as far as art, mm -hmm. the best art I saw Fiji. was in Suga, Fiji, mm -hmm. in the museum there where the British had collected. Yeah. Just incredible. It, and it was one of these old, old-fashioned museums where there was glass cases up to the ceiling and mm -hmm. rows and rows and thousands of, the, of artifacts. Kind of like there. the bishops and you had to really stop to look at the stuff. Uh, there was so much of it. It, it was overpowering. I mean, they had, you know, those big uh, canoe rudders that mm -hmm. were 15 feet long and just amazing stuff that they had, I think, pretty much got from the Germans in World War II. The Germans were great at collecting that ethnographic mm -hmm. material, and then they left it all when World War I started. The British picked it all up and put it in museums. And, uh, of course, there was great museums in uh, in uh, New Zealand, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Maori stuff. And, and how many months was that that you did uh, all the crisscrossing? about six, seven months. Including everything in New Zealand and Australia, the whole thing. Yeah, and I know that affected your art because I've. I mean, I still yeah. see it today that some of the well, I took totems a, and things. The, uh, some of the art history classes I took were uh, were well. There was one art history teacher that was really thorough, and uh, I took a whole semester of uh, uh, oceanic art, mm. and and one of uh, American Indian. And one of African, mm. a guy named Whitney Halstead, was the professor that taught it. And uh, what was really wonderful was you not only see the slides in, in art class and stuff, then you could go over to the Field Museum and see the real right. thing. Right. Yeah. They had incredible. They collections. do. They have amazing yeah. collections. So, so you so, were very familiar with it before you ever hit the road to. Oh yeah. All these islands. I knew. Yeah, and and you know, I I never saw stuff like I saw at the Field Museum. But uh, yeah, I wanted to. And see if you get down below the field museum, you'll see even more. I don't know if you ever have done that before, but I've gone down below the, oh, in the yeah, catacombs. It, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, the art institute's the same way. Mm, I bet. Getting in the in the storerooms and stuff, you see, ten times they have ten times more stuff stored than they do on exhibit. Do you have to give them something as a student? Do you have some of your work there from that? In the Art Institute? Uh, no, I don't think the Art Institute owns anything of mine. Yeah. Unless it was given to them later. 
And when you're in Australia doing this, you know, this wanderlust kind of a thing, did, there was there much Aboriginal art to be seen or yeah. purchased and that kind of thing at Some, that time? Some in Alice Springs and mm -hmm. that. Uh, when I when I went to Alice Springs, I went down to Adelaide and I got on a train. It's called the Gam, which is a famous train now. Mm -hmm. In those days, it was like. 1890s frontier wooden coaches mm, wow know, open windows in, in, uh -huh. in, you know it was middle of the summer there and and uh, everybody was drinking big cans of fosters and that was it you, know, you slept on a board <laughs> including you yeah um so it was pretty primitive um one <laughs> one of the experiences i had that had nothing to do with art was when I got to Alice Springs, I was walking down the street along by the railroad tracks and there was a, a flat car loaded with bales of hay and there was a guy loading them off the, the uh, train onto his truck. Mm -hmm. And I had thrown a few bales in my day and so I went over and helped him. He said, why don't you come out to my station for a couple of days? And I said, okay. So, you know, I, I was just- Yeah, you're free loose and fancy free. Yeah. As you say. So we went out there and uh, this guy was in the dog food business and he was buying horses that had some kind of sleeping sickness. They had staggers and I, I, you know, I'd seen this before in horses. Yeah, equine disease. But uh, he had a whole corral full of these horses and, and uh, what he would do when one of them started, he was feeding them all and keeping them as healthy as he could, watering them, all that. And when one started to get really bad, he would butcher it and then take the meat into a cooler in, in, in Alice Springs and sell it for dog food. Mm. So he, one morning, he, I, after I'd been out there a day, he said, okay, come on, we're gonna go butcher a horse. And so I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So. He had an old wrecker with a crane on the back, and he backed up to the corral and brought one horse over and shot it with a twenty-two right between the eyes, dropped it, picked it up with his wrecker, and hung it up in the thing. And then we drove out to a place where there was a deep arroyo in the desert, and uh, he backed it up kind of to the edge of that. And he said, uh, okay, you get up in the back of the truck here by this pile of newspapers, and I'm going to throw meat to you. <laughs> so Thank God. He, he got out and he put on his butcher kit. This guy had been a butcher in the Australian army in the North African desert in uh, World War II. Uh, so he got his thing on. He started yeah. sharpening his knives and stuff. And he took that horse apart. I mean, I've seen horses butchered before, not like this guy. He took that horse apart in about 15 minutes and started throwing slabs of meat to me. You know, like five pound yeah. roast and stuff. Right. And I was wrapping a newspaper and stick him in, just piling him in the back of his truck. Well, in <laughs> 15 minutes, I was covered with blood and everything. <laughs> and it occurred to me, it was Thanksgiving. Uh, huh. <laughs> so, that day. So we're butchering all these, all this horse meat and Thanksgiving. And that was, it was kind of an incongruous kind of experience. But yeah. Anyways, it worked out fine. And so you just hung out there for a few days. Yeah, and, and then got showered, and he gave he gave you some free food, and you yeah, and you gave yeah. him free work. Yeah, yeah, and then off you go. Right. And so when you come back from this long wanderlust, what do you do? Now you're almost thirty at this point. Uh well, I had uh, I had been dating Lynn, my wife, mm -hmm. uh, who's also an artist. For those who don't know, Lynn Tabor. Yeah. Um, before I left, and. We had got engaged, but she knew I had to take this fellowship trip, and so I did. So, so when I got back, uh, I flew. I flew from uh, Sydney to, to Los Angeles, and I had I had uh, a, a few dollars left from my fellowship funds. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good, actually. And this and this round trip ticket that was still good. So I took the rest of the money and I bought a first class ticket on Pan Am <laughs> from Sydney to to uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> and uh and I got on the plane and I was the only person in first class. Yeah, and you're usually a young kid. <laughs> yeah. And so I had these two beautiful stewardesses trying to 
give me drinks and food and everything the right. whole time. And, and I was just digging it. <laughs> and uh, we stopped in, um, in uh, Pango Pango to mm -hmm. refuel at like three in the morning and got off and walked around, got back on in my first class suite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so Lynn met me at the airport in LA and uh, I brought her several lays and uh, and I didn't know what we were what what the plan was, but she said, uh, "Okay, we're going to, we're getting on another plane right now." And I said, "Oh yeah, where are we going?" She said, "We're going to Aspen for for New Year's." So and I didn't know it, but my mother and my brothers were all in Aspen for New Year's. So uh, she hadn't told them that I was coming, mm -hmm. and uh, so we surprised them all. Got you know. I was in a, like a Hawaiian shirt and a little leather coat. <laughs> I froze my butt off <laughs> flying from, from right, Denver sure. to, to Aspen on that DC three. But um, so that was that was fun getting back and all that. And then then came back, and um, Lynn was still in graduate school at the Art Institute, and she had another semester I think to go. <laughs> And so I, I came back to Chicago and started making sculpture mm. in my mother's basement. Mm. And uh, then uh, that summer, Lynn and I got married and then rented a place and, and a, a little house with a, a garage that I had as a studio. And she had a room for her, her studio. Were you able to find a representation for your art right off the bat? I mean, you had some big awards, uh, Chicago Art Institute yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, I, 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 I showed at a couple of galleries, small galleries, and and still entered shows. In Chicago, there was a there was a, a group called the North Shore Art League mm -hmm. that was very instrumental in putting on exhibitions for for uh, established as well as unestablished artists, and they had. Uh, they had a, a an art fair at a at a like a shopping mall, but it was really first class. It mm -hmm. was not. It was juried, for one thing, and uh, it was not decorator art. It was fine art, and so I applied to those, and I showed in that for several years. Another thing that the North Shore Art League did was uh, they had a show called New Horizons that they did every year, and it was New Horizons in sculpture, and they would rent or lease different venues in the downtown area in Chicago mm -hmm. and put on a sculpture exhibition. And one year it was at McCormick Place, which was a big, uh, you probably know what that mm -hmm. is. Uh, another time it was at the Marina City and Navy Pier and all these different places. And so I entered that and, and uh, won a number of prizes in those shows. Mm -hmm. So I was doing big wood laminations at the time. Mm. And uh, and then uh, Lynn was teaching, Lynn, when she graduated, she started teaching at the high school that I had graduated from. And uh, so we were living in Northbrook, a suburb. This is kind of early 70s time frame? No, late 60s. Still, still late 60s, yeah. okay. And uh, and uh, a friend of mine was the uh, head of the art department at this high school where I had graduated. And uh, he called me one day and he said the other guy that I knew who had been teaching sculpture got sick and couldn't continue. And would I take a semester of teaching sculpture in this high school? I said, sure. So it was really kind of interesting because it was deja vu. I went back to the classrooms where I had had metal shop and wood shop, and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and was teaching these kids sculpture. And a lot of it was just babysitting mm -hmm. problem kids. But there was still maybe a third of the class were really serious about making art. And they were the ones I really focused yeah. on and tried to help. And Do you think you helped said, anybody oh, yeah. when you were a teacher? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you like teaching? I loved teaching. I hated the bureaucracy. Mm. You liked helping the children, not just not all the paperwork well, and crap that went away with it. Well, they weren't children. You know, they were 
Well, high school. Young adults. And, yeah. And then, and when I was teaching at graduate school. Yeah. They, they were, still seem they like children to me, having some in that age group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all on your perspective. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> but yeah, no, to, to, uh, and I've always done that. I taught a graduate seminar in sculpture at the university here a few years ago uh, and really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. And still keep in contact with a lot of the kids. And do you feel like you learn from the students that you t would teach as well, as far as? Uh, in your own, about your own craft? No, but I feel an obligation to uh, the people that taught me. Uh, there's nothing I could teach them really or very mm -hmm. little, but I could take that and pass it on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. and so I think the the whole idea of passing it on is important. You know, once you have gained a certain knowledge and skill uh, and abilities to do things, it's wonderful to pass it on. Yeah, give it, other people, give it on. If, particularly if it's something you get a lot of, of positive feedback from, mm -hmm. you know, the joy or whatever you want to call it. And do you know if any of those kids uh, ever became known uh, artists as well? Do you know? Well, I know a, a number of them have had successful lives as artists. I don't, you know, no, yeah. I don't think any of them are in the top 10 of U.S. artists nowadays or making millions yeah but if they're making a living and have done it as a yeah. profession to yeah, me they, that's yeah. that's a success they managed to do that but probably very few of them actually are uh making a living as an artist mm. the uh, it's a hard thing to do isn't it oh it's really hard yeah the uh when i was at the art institute teaching lynn was in grad was in undergraduate school uh, the University of Chicago Department of Education came to the Art Institute and started this extensive study that lasted for two years, examining her class and and like the sophomore and junior class of the undergraduates, mm -hmm. interviewing them and following them through extensive studies about what they were doing, trying to figure out what how you teach creativity, you know, <laughs> good luck, how you how you do it or what it's all about and so this took place and Lynn was interviewed a number of times and you know they dolls uh, blah 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 and then it disappeared and it all got stuffed in some kind of closet someplace in University of Chicago mm -hmm. 20 some years later when we were living here on the mountain in Tucson Lynn got a call from this gal who was a doctoral student at the University of Chicago. She had found all this material mm. and was doing a follow-up to see Yeah, what did they happened. make it? Yeah. You know, what what is there any validity to what they had, had amassed in all this information? And she was searching out all the people from these two classes that Lynn had uh, and was traveling around and interviewing mm. them. So she made an appointment to come and stay with us in Tucson for a couple of days. And uh, she was particularly interested in Lynn because she was married to an artist too. And I had been at the Art Institute at the same time anyway. Mm -hmm. So she came and she was really nice and she you know, was asking us all these questions and stuff. And after she had been there for a day or so, we started asking her questions about you know what she was finding out. And at first she was kind of reticent. She didn't want to use names and things like that, mm -hmm. people we knew. But she said, you know, it's like out of a hundred people I've interviewed, maybe two of them are making still, still making art. Well, lots of them are in related fields where the visual mm -hmm. thing is, is important, but very few of them are, are, are really making art. Making art. It does not art. surprise me. At all. Yeah, no, it doesn't. She said, and and I got into a lot of situations where I would start bringing, you know, the history of these individuals up and their art careers, and they would start getting very emotional, and even to the point of a few people brought tears and stuff mm. like that that they had abandoned right their art career right. and gone and and I saw that so much 
so many times from the students that I've had over the years where they get out of college and they start and then they get married and they have a couple of kids and they have the responsibility of raising these kids. And so they go out and they find a, a regular paying job and everything. And they, um, the art just goes by the way. Yeah. They I think just, that's the norm. Yeah, I think it is too. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to make it as a professional artist yeah. and, and stay on it, especially yeah. when you get in these situations, which you're always going to have, whether it's a two oh, you know, nine eleven or a two oh eight, two oh nine, oh, yeah. where you go, okay, I just can't make it, and do I struggle through for a year or two, or do I go get a job, and you know, and I've got bills to pay and kids to feed and all that, and they get a job, and then all of a sudden you're kind of locked into this new world, and you, and you're, there goes the art career. Yeah, well, I've been very fortunate in that that uh, I got you know teaching jobs right out of college, and and was selling some sculpture to make somewhat of a living and had family support mm -hmm. and then got other jobs teaching. I taught a semester at the National College of Education in mm -hmm. Evanston and uh, and then coming out here and and uh, having shows. And I taught I, I showed at the at the uh, Tucson Art Center before it was the Tucson Museum of Art. Mm. Just Mm -hmm. so, the two-man show there in 1970. Or anyway. And you have art there in front of the Tucson Museum of Art as well. Yeah. They have a number of pieces of mine in their collection. Mm -hmm. um, but I was fortunate also into making some blind real estate investments that uh, just, I just, the timing was right and yeah. It just happened. I got a loan from one of my aunts, bought some property, and uh, and the and the value just skyrocketed. It wasn't yeah. because I was so smart or anything. Well, you bought but, good location. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which nobody wanted. You know, nobody yeah. wanted mountainside, and I built <laughs> roads and stuff, and so it could be done. And then all of a sudden, people said, "Yeah, oh yeah." Yeah. When did you uh, buy that property? Bought that property in 1969. 69 and when there was there any we moved this, here in 70 there was nothing here sunrise was a dirt road so sunrise was a dirt road and, and the flying uh, v ranch was there yeah and there was a few houses up in the end of sabino canyon road little ranches yeah and could you was, drive your car to into sabino canyon still at that time oh yeah yeah oh yeah and so and there was nothing at all zero no, no. weston no no uh, lows obviously no, just no. you yeah and you started building that house in 70? Well, we moved into a little homestead that uh, an adobe homestead that had been built there by the people that homesteaded the land mm. uh, in the 20s. Where is that? Where is that building? That was at, just on the, on the uh, west side of uh, Esperero Canyon. And is it still there? No. Mm, too bad. Yeah, it's gone. There was a couple of houses on the other side of the creek there of the canyon that belonged to a, a family that had been the uh, the director of the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Mm. Yeah, that's right. I know those houses. Okay. Anyway. Oh uh, yeah, Andrew Wilde lived there for a while too. Yeah, it was my house, one of them, the little rock house. He, he oh, do you lived in, in one of those? Yeah. Oh, okay. I owned one. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Back in Rattlesnake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So you yeah. were so you started building the roads yourself because you had all this ability to work with heavy machinery and things. Well, I had. I had or you that, learned it that I, I I wanted to. So yeah, when I when I when I when I started living out there, I I I had a, a garage that I used as a studio. That's where I made that. Uh, that big piece that's at the community center, the stainless piece called Arrows. Mm -hmm. That's the huge piece. Yeah, it's stainless steel piece. Yeah, yeah, it's outside the, off the corner of the music hall there at the community center. Mm -hmm. And uh, and was showing in in little galleries here and stuff like that, and selling some stuff. But the art world in Tucson was pretty small. Yeah. Did you sell your own things too as well? Your own art. Yeah. 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 And were you showing in any yeah, other that, galleries, yeah, like in I Chicago or it, New York or any uh, of those? I showed at the Gilman Gallery in Chicago. Mm -hmm. and, and I showed at the Harlan Gallery here, which was 
uh, I can't remember what street it was on, kind of mid midtown someplace. And then uh, there was a woman that had uh, a, a, a business called Creative Directions, mm -hmm. Karen Demarest, and she would had she did had like pop up galleries, and so I showed with her a number of different places, the Temple of Music and Art, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Did you did you find a, a, a audience here? I mean, because you do modern sculpture, or at least what I would consider more like in the David Smith uh, kind of sensibilities, some of it, and not too much. Yeah, I wouldn't think it. I mean, not at that time frame. I wouldn't think so. No. And uh, it was, seems like it'd be more. So that's Chicago. why I continued to show in Chicago. Yes. Yeah. Keep those galleries. Yes. Stuff. Yeah. But that flipped at some point for Tucson, don't you think? Yeah. Well. When the when the when the uh, Tucson Museum of Art was built, mm -hmm. that made a big difference. But still, you know, the, there's always been Western art has been always real strong in Tucson, mm -hmm. the MO Club, and yeah, still is, and all that. Yeah, you know, obviously. Yeah, uh, but I mean, even a gallery like mine, which may be known for, for Western art, is it's I carry a large selection of modern art. Yeah, which I love. Yeah. So, well, art's art. You know, yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter <laughs> whether it's native or yeah or native born, or whatever. Uh, so what? See, what were we focusing so, on? So yeah, so you um, we're, we'll get back to what you were doing when you started really making art in Tucson. So you built your house. This was in oh yeah nineteen seventy. I, I, I used to I used to hike a lot up in the mountains, all over Catalinas. Yeah, yeah, just. Uh, take a sandwich and go all day and go hiking up yes. there and found all kinds of great stuff and found this site which where, is now above Ventana for those who yeah know. which is which is where I built the house yes. and the studio and all that loves Ventana um, and uh, I, I I bought that land from a guy named Joe Sawyers who was an early developer and house builder here in town not a big not a really big Estes type guy, but mm -hmm. just a real competent guy. And uh, that was like ninety acres, or more. Well, we bought forty acres first, and then we bought another ninety mm. after that, and sold half the forty acres and paid for the ninety. It was, a, you know, that's when property values. Yeah, were. you just bought at the right time. Yeah, in the right yeah. location. Yeah, and um, I looked at property all over Tucson, the Tucson mountains, and. Mm -hmm. Different places, and this appealed to me the best. So um, I met a guy through Joe Sawyer's, a guy named Link Wilson, who was a former railroader in, t in Southern Pacific, I guess. And he had bought a whole bunch of, of property in Catalina 1, 2, and 3, mm -hmm. a whole long. He would bought it years ago, and part of it was the Pontotoc Mine, mm. which is a mine that's up there that nobody knows about uh, in the middle of that, the housing development, which is a huge hole in the ground. Off Pontotoc Drive? Well, Pontotoc Drive drives up to it. Yeah. But it was a mine in World War I and World War II, and it's just a huge hole in the ground mm -hmm. that you could drop a house into, and it's like, Mm -hmm. Six stories deep, and uh -huh. then there's tunnels that go yeah. underneath it. And he had he had developed Catalina one, two, and three, and putting the roads and and the utilities and stuff like that. And he had a bulldozer with a backhoe on it, and a rock drill and a compressor and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty much he was like in his eighties, and he wanted to sell it. So I said, well, I'll, you know, I made him a deal if he'd come and show me how to. Use it. How to use it and how to drill and how to blast and everything. And I was going to build this road up to this site. Mm -hmm. So it was like, if you don't ask, you'll never know. And if you don't try, you'll never find out if you can do it or not. Mm -hmm. So I I just thought, what the hell, you know, try it. <laughs> see what happens. So I bought this old bulldozer and he helped me rebuild it all. And uh, so then we started uh, laying out the road and stuff. And I hired another guy with a bulldozer who had, he had been one of the people, one of the bulldozer operators that had 
built the road to uh, the telescopes at uh, yeah Mount Graham somewhere. No, no, at uh, you know west of the rest of the reservation there. Mm -hmm. What's the big telescope out there? Well, the only one I know is the Mount Graham, but there's I'm sure there's other ones. Kit Peak. Kit maybe? Peak. Yeah. yeah. He and another guy built the road to Kit Peak. So he was clearly capable. He, he of was going. clearly capable. So he pioneered just a track yeah. that I could get my bulldozer in and start working the, the road and drilling the patterns and blasting and all with that. dynamite, I assume. With dynamite. Yeah. What's that like to put a piece of dynamite in the well? In, it's and for a, the very it, first time you've never done it. Well, that's why I had Link there. Yeah. Teaching me how to do it and everything. And uh, in and those he, days. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you just go buy dynamite? In the early 70s. Well, you couldn't just go buy it. But uh, there was a guy named Pruitt that had a business selling explosives, yeah. dynamite and stuff, and caps and primer cord and all that in town. And he had a, a couple of magazines. One was up around the end of Bush Ridge and another was way south of town. And you would call him and order what you wanted. And uh, so Link... And I went and visited him, and he, you know, Link kind of said, you know, this guy's okay. He's you're not going to blow up some he's, building. Yeah, he's yeah, he yeah, actually yeah. wants to do something right. with the road. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I could start buying powder from from uh, Pruitt, and uh, you'd call ahead, and and he would bring it into town in his little shop, and then you could pick, he couldn't store it overnight in town, but you mm -hmm. you could pick it up and take it here. Place and there was certain regulations about how you stored it, where you kept it, and stuff like that. So, um, Link came and, and showed me how to how to drill patterns, how to how to run a rock drill, and how mm -hmm. to, how you you drill two feet down, and you take that bit out and put a four foot bit in, and then start and go mm -hmm. down another two feet, all that the patterns, the depth, and all that. And I was using dynamite and uh, stuff called prills, which is ammonium nitrate and mm. diesel fuel. Mm. Uh, it comes in big sacks. It looks like uh, soap flakes kind of or mm -hmm. something. And uh, he had a little tin can, tin can. He would measure it with and say, you put this much in a four-foot hole. And mm -hmm. Then you put a stick of dynamite on top of it and you load it and put the thing and you have the fuse comes out. and You tie the fuse to this and that. And there's this whole special dynamite knot you use. All right. So he spent about a month working with me, teaching me all this stuff. And uh, so I started blasting. Yeah, so what was that like the first time you let, you the, put off a fuse? Power. I bet. <laughs> Must have been something else, right? Yeah, it's scary. I mean, I'd, <laughs> huh? I'd shot off firecrackers and stuff like that. Yeah, but this was something else. And big rocks are going everywhere. Yeah. No, you, you had to be careful. Do you have any neighbors going, hey, what's going on? No. There were no neighbors, No, really. but... But uh, Link t told me, he said, you know, whenever you shoot, call the sheriff's department, let them know ahead of time. And I always did that. Yeah. Call them. And he, they knew that I was working with him and it was cool because he'd been blasting for years. Yeah. Um, and then after, after working there for a couple of years, building this road, I started in like 1972 and finished in 77, I guess, 76. Wow. And um, wow. five years of doing that. Yeah. Well, and put a water line in and all yeah. that too. You know, I wasn't working seven days a week or five days a week at that. And I had some uh, illegal selling me some of the time and just whatever I could get going. But uh, after a while, after a couple of years, the, the, this guy Pruitt, who had the the uh, the dynamite stored in these bunkers outside of Tucson? Some kids went out there one day with an armor-piercing .30-06 and tried to shoot the lock off and blew themselves up. Wow! And it was one hell of an explosion. It was all, it was all over the pit, news and everything. I was driving up Craycroft uh, at the time when it was still just a dirt crossing at the creek there. And so, mm -hmm and saw this huge column of smoke come up the backside of the Catalinas and thought a jet had crashed or something mm. from Tegas Ponte. And uh, got home and 
start hearing on the stick on the news about this. All the windows are blowing out for miles around oh, this wow. place. They kill I mean, the kids? Oh, yeah. They were both shredded. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, there was like 15 tons of explosives. All oh, kinds wow. In there. It was huge. And, and, and Pruitt was out of business. Uh, Which meant you were out of business for your well, road. So I called the you know the sheriff's department and said you know what what about this how can I continue doing this stuff and they said well why don't you just uh, go down to Apache Powder we will send you a letter that says that you've been you know doing this for several years and, and that you've been very really, really responsible about doing it and always notified us and mm -hmm. you you know you know what you're doing and stuff like that so I I called uh, Apache Powder down in beyond Vincent there. And I said, yeah, come on down and we'll sell you what you need. And so I went down there and uh, their, their security is really strict. Mm. You know, you can't even take a matches or anything in there. You have to take everything out of your pockets yeah. to go in there. Understandably. And uh, so I, I went in and, and I took I took Link's can that, I, that we was measuring the right the, amount of dynamite or powder. Powder with. And uh, I explained to them what I was doing. The patterns I was using and how much I was loading everything, and like to their engineers and the guys, that's exactly what we told you to do. You know, you're doing it perfectly right. So, continue doing it. And uh, they gave me a couple of tips about uh, using delays, fuses, and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, to that's... to cut my sheer walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, building this thing took five years. The road. Building the road took seven, eight, eight, three, four, four or five years, yeah. And when did Ventana come in there? Oh, that was much later. But when was that? Do you remember? That was in the uh, early, uh, late 80s? Early, no, early 80s. Early 80s. They started So your house. 82. Yeah, we were out there. There was nothing. Yeah, you were way above it. And then Ventana came in and yeah. took up this huge area and built a hotel and all that. What was your feeling about that when they do that to you? to, you know, this pristine desert and where you live. Well, my feeling was, what can I do about it? Yeah. I mean, part I'm of you, I'm sure your so prices, you you your value of your homes are going to go, your home is going to yeah, go up. Well, but. that was that, you know, that whole thing was going in. And, and uh, there was opportunity there too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when when they started working, they're digging up and putting all the underground utilities and mm -hmm. everything. They were gonna they dug up our road, you know, so right. our access. So I had my attorney call Bill Estes and say, you know, if you're gonna block him off, you're gonna do this and that. And yeah. That. And he said, fine. Yeah. So your roads got better. Your entrance. Your oh yeah yeah. Well, egress it, it, got better. Well, yeah, Eating. we got paved roads and yeah. stuff like that, and a part of the plus one of your big, that we big sculpture that, ended up in front well, that of was Lowe's. Ten right? years later, yeah. Well, it still happened though, right? Yeah. So I went to work. Uh, well, the agreement that we made with the Estes Company, Bill and Shirley, was uh, yeah, they could go ahead and do whatever they wanted, and uh, and they would uh, work with the sub to. Uh, to facilitate us getting in and out and stuff. They rented us a car so we could have a car on the outside of the ditch and mm. one on the inside. Mm. Uh, and they also said they were, they would run, they were running utilities all over the place. They run them to us too. Mm. And Bill wanted me to go to work for him as a, as a consultant to work with uh, Shirley Estes mm -hmm. and selecting all the art for the hotel and the country club and mm. all that. And uh, also to be an aesthetic engineer on the project. And you did that? And I did. Oh, so yeah, that's was, why there's some good art there. Well, yeah. Yeah, because there is. So, uh, yeah, I enjoyed working with the corporate world there. I was, I gave them like two or three days a week, and the rest of the time I was working on my own stuff. And were you making the sculptures up at your house at that point? Yeah. Yeah. And you had this huge um, blacksmith kind of yeah, setup. Yeah, the trip hammer. Yeah, tell tell us about this trip hammer thing. It's, I saw it in the action. Trip hammer is a is a well, if you've never seen one, it, it just looks like a big hunk of iron. Mm -hmm. It's a pneumatic. 
which means air, air powered ram that floats on air. Mm -hmm. The ram weighs 250 pounds and it's floating on air pressure. Mm -hmm. And at the back of the, of the machine is a huge compressor that's run by an electric motor. And it's controlled by a foot lever mm -hmm. or a hand lever. Mm -hmm. And it's for, it's for forging, for taking and forming hot steel. And it has just two flat dies that go like that. Right. One comes down. <clears throat> and the model I had was a, was a 2B. It came off of a World War II U.S. Navy destroyer tender, <laughs> a, a, a workship that would go out and repair other ships. Mm. And the machine was built in 1941 and put right onto the ship. <clears throat> it was called a shipboard model, and it bolted right to the deck of the ship. And I don't know what it would have been like underneath it, but it was bam, 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 bam. It was loud. Yeah, and heavy. And he well, it weighs about three and a half tons. Yeah. And um, and so when you, how'd you get that up the damn hill? Put it on a trailer. Uh-huh. And I bought it from a, a guy who bought it from the the uh, Navy in, in uh, San Francisco. And the truck down and then put on a smaller trailer and chained down and drug up the hill. Because that was huge. Yeah. And and then had to put a, like a two foot concrete foundation underneath it. Right. To uh, absorb the shock. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a uh, it's an industrial forging tool that uh, it's they're starting to come back now. There's more and more artists using them or hmm. blacksmiths. Artist blacksmith. Um, and you use that to make your sculpture. I use that to form steel. Yeah, yeah. hot steel. And so you would you would heat it there as well. You know, oh, like I built a forge out of yeah. a fifty-five gallon drum that ran on natural gas, which Estes had put up there for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you can heat the steel up to two thousand degrees, so it's yellow or white hot. And mm -hmm. Stick it in this hammer and start beating on it. Mm -hmm. and uh, make different dies to fit on those flat dies to, to make different shapes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all the stuff in the book that's forged like that. You can see the different shaped dies. How many artists do some, something like that? I mean, there's a lot of skill set that's involved to be able to do something like that and have the not only just the mechanical set of skills, but also then you have to put the creativity to it. I can't imagine... There's a lot of people that can do that. You got to have the desire. Yeah. But I mean, you know, if you desire, if you want something bad enough, you do it. Mm -hmm. Or you figure out how to do it. And I think that's one of the things I really like about sculpture is that <clears throat> you get an idea. <clears throat> and when you get an idea, that's creating a problem. How are you going to make this? Mm -hmm. You know, how is it going to stand up? How's you know? How are you going to deal with the material, whatever it is? And uh, how's it not going to kill you when you're making it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and that's I've known people that died making sculpture. Yeah, I'm, I could see with what you do that could have yeah, happened easily. Yeah, Luis Jimenez. Yeah, I know. A friend of mine you know, had his piece fall on him and kill him. Yep. Anyway, um, yeah, you have to be careful because you're dealing with lots of power and thousands of degrees and you know sharp things and yes it's, it's right all and stuff you got to pay attention with your yeah doing. and you're putting your own labor pushing and pulling and things can yeah. break or snap or yeah. not go as expected right did yeah. you ever have any oh yeah it's gone on my face i had a a, uh, a grinding wheel blew up oh cut me in the face yeah things like that yeah you know shoot, my arms are all scarred up from different stuff but uh and and you started using rocks as well, incorporating rocks with metal. Yeah, I did some stone carving when I was at, at uh, the Art Institute. Not a lot, but uh, when I got out here, well, actually, I'd, I'd known about it from years before, like in the Grand Canyon or, or the creeks and stuff in northern Arizona. Mm -hmm. Beautiful boulders, you know. Yeah, big with round the great ones, shapes, colors, and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and it's like you know, taking a tree and cutting it down and use utilizing it 
the natural materials to create something else. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember when you seemed put, like a natural thing to me to do? Yeah. When did you put the first boulder with metal? You remember when? In, you, yeah. In uh, <clears throat> when I was in graduate school. Oh, early on then. Yeah. Um, my grandmother had a place up in southern Wisconsin, and there was farms around there, and in the corners of all the fields were these boulders, the right, glacial boulders, mm -hmm. that, where they had cleared them, and I'd just go up and find. God, this is a great boulder. Can I have this? Yeah, get it out of here. <laughs> you can have them all. <laughs> you know, and uh, so we get got a lot of boulders that way. And uh, and you also got an oak tree off your grandmother's. No, that was a walnut tree. Walnut. I'm sorry. Yeah, walnut. Yeah. Tree. And you um, used that walnut for a whole. Yeah, it was a, a beautiful walnut tree. Right in the back of her farm, there was a row of big walnut trees. Mm -hmm. Somebody had planted. You know, hundred years ago or something, and uh, I asked her one day, "Could I have one of those trees?" And she knew what I was doing, mm -hmm. and she said, "Yeah." So I went out there with a chainsaw and dropped this tree, and cut it up into usable lengths, and uh, then took hot wax and sealed the ends of all the logs, mm -hmm. and uh, started utilizing them. And I used some in graduate school and some of and some I hauled out here. Mm -hmm. I still, you know, I'm, I'm done with them. I have some pieces of smaller ones, but no big logs anymore. The, the uh, what, 77, I guess, was the yeah. last log. Yeah, 77. I After, sure. um, uh, well, that one piece I did that's called Jessie's Tree. Yes. Is that, that's her tree. Her name is Jessie. Yes. And that was a big piece, which we sold. And then yeah, I, that was that one that had all the branches. Oh, I remember it. it very well. And then I have a little one that's one of your earliest ones. I don't know. You probably don't even know about it, but it's probably done in the sixties. It's in your book. It's like a cube with looks like this. I'll have to show you an image of it. But it's out of that same piece, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's well, that a, got a lot of a lot, lot of work, of right? So we're talking. What is that? Well, it's a 50, big tree. 50 years of use, right? One tree, 50 years. Yeah. Amazing. And so now you're, you're not doing the forging so much, right? No. Nah. Is that because it's just too physically demanding? Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Those, uh, you know, I was forging two and three inch square bars or round bars and pieces. And, you know, they weigh 50 or 100 pounds. Right. And when they're red hot. Yeah. Or white hot, you you can, you know you got to have machinery to move them. It just yeah, it's just, my back just can't stand that anymore. I'm still doing pretty good sized wood carving. Yeah, but you're doing yeah big carving still. But um, no, in fact, I sold the hammer back to the to the uh, guys that I got it from. It's back in in uh, Oakland. Oh, that's funny. They're still in they were still in business. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And is it, use it being used for an artist or who knows? Well, the guy's an artist blacksmith. Okay. So it went back to him. Yeah, they did architectural blacksmithing mainly. It wasn't, it, they weren't making uh, car parts or something. They were making art. And you've done, the one piece that you did in Phoenix, was, which was so huge. Uh, how big is that one? It's just the size of 40 a football feet, field. 40 feet high, 73 feet across. <laughs> And where is it located in Phoenix? University and 32nd Street. And so how long does it take you to do a sculpture of that magnitude? Well, I did it in solid bar first. Mm -hmm. And that piece is here in the private collection in town. And then uh, I was approached to do a, uh, from a, a, well, by an art rep who was representing a company, a developing company in Phoenix. Mm -hmm that um, wanted to do a signature piece for their business park, mm -hmm. which was called South Bank, which is on the South Bank of the Salt River. And uh, so they had asked a number of artists to submit ideas to them, and they were going to select one. And uh, so I, I took this piece that I had made and thought, you know, it would be really great monumental. And uh, made some drawings and sketches and stuff. And uh, 
I submitted it mm -hmm. along with the budget and everything like that. Well, uh, they liked it, I guess, because they, <laughs> totally. wanted, they spent all the money to to build it. Then I had to. Then after I got the commission, I had to figure out how the hell to do it. Yeah, I mean, where do you? But it seems like you'd almost have to build it up. Well, I went to T.A. Cadence on a big metal fabricator here in town who yes. built other things for me in the past years ago. And uh, first I went to university and I had them take and use their computer drawing things to make, to figure out the dimensions mm -hmm. and the angles that, and mm -hmm. how it all intersected and stuff like that. Yeah, because you got to make it safe too. Cause it's oh, yeah. Public piece. It's well, huge. then I took it to Cades and had their engineers look at it. Yes. And give me a price on fabricating it. And uh, so they did, and everything was cool. Uh, and so we went ahead and started fabricating it down at their plant here in north of the airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, they assigned like three or four guys to work with me on this piece. And after after being down there for a week or so, the uh, the shop steward, his union shop, went to management and said, this guy's not union. He's he's working in here. He can't be working in here because mm -hmm. I wanted to be, a, you know, I wanted to hands on in this. Deal. Right. And so the the, uh, the owner of the company took him back out and he said, you see this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy's paying their wages. You have a problem with that? <laughs> And the guy said, well, no, I guess not. So we started working again. You know, started getting some of the pieces built. And uh, several weeks later, I went in one morning to go to work. And here's all these union bosses, you know, the guys with the coats and ties, you know, the, mm -hmm. the suits. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're all standing in front of a partially completed piece getting photographed. And like, what the hell is this? And so they wanted a picture of this whole thing going on their union newsletter. Yeah. So <laughs> that that's that was the end of the problem with them. But, and how long so how long did it take you to make that piece? Uh start to finish, it was about from from the original concept to you know, contact to finish installation with the governor dedicating it and all that it was about nine months. Mm. And that's that's like being an architect, you know. I, I mean, I love to be mm -hmm. working, having my hands in it. And I had a lot of hands in with those, with that piece. In fact, I showed them some stuff that they didn't know how to do, mm -hmm. which surprised me, but uh, things I wanted done. And uh, I wouldn't want to make a career out of making yeah. those kinds of things. Did, did you make decent money on doing a project like that? When all well, said and done? Well, yeah, I mean, 40 cents an hour probably or something yeah, like I, that. Yeah, I mean, I wonder because, you know, you don't know exactly what it's going to take you to, you bid it out, well, and you, but you, you know, want to yeah. get the bid, but. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I made some money, but. Not compared to what you could have if you probably just sat around and made other arts, well, but, smaller Well, you know, but, but, but you're also, it's rewarding to do something like that, to to the the challenge to when you're done, to look at something that's forty feet high and say, right, I made that. Right, and do you feel like that was one of your, or maybe your premier piece? That piece? No. No. What is there, or is there? Well, there there's premier pieces from different periods. Yes. You know, yeah, that was a that was a signature piece from that time. That's it's. it's it's of course the largest monumental piece I've ever done, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't want to continue making just those kinds of pieces because you don't get to be hands on so right. much. And the, the the whole time element too, where you don't get to explore other ideas and stuff. Right, you know, it's you nine months. It's you know, do this and get it over with, and right. go there and see that. And it takes you a long time to do some of your pieces, even now. I mean, you'll work on a piece for almost a year, won't you? Sometimes some of these well, big that's pieces, now, you know, yeah, still it, now though. Yeah, but I mean, I just can't work as fast as I did yeah. those days. I mean, I can work several hours a day, but that's it. And you're hand carving, yeah, you know, hard woods. Yeah, yeah. By the way, when's the next one coming? 
I got a, I got some got a couple <laughs> since coins. I just sold one of your last big pieces. Yeah, that I'm looking. I don't for. know if I, I don't know if I'll ever make another big one like that. I hope you do. Well, I don't know. I, it's finding those logs is really difficult. I'm sure. Uh, and that's one of the issues. I've got the word out around the ranch and in the area of the valley there. They're cutting a lot of mesquite out of there, uh, which is it's an invasive uh, tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're bringing it back to rangeland. But most of them are scrubby and broken yeah, up. Yeah, you need that. big, big but, logs. But I, the guys that are doing that know that if they come across a big one, that I would be yeah. happy to have it. So. And so what's now? What's... What's the next step for you? You're 80 now? 80. Yep. What do you see the next 10 years as an artist? I don't know. Um, Still creating, of course. Well, you know, there was a period in the time when I was making art and I was like reaching for the brass ring. Uh -huh. You know, I wanted to make a name for yourself and get in, in museums and getting into really good collections and all that. Right. And that period of my life is gone. Now I just, I'm more interested just in enjoying the sensation of creating, carving, welding, manipulating, forging, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, utilizing the skills that I developed that uh, and the tools and stuff, some of which I've made myself. It's kind of, it's what I am. It's who, who I am. It's what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, you sell art, I make art. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, well, it's like those kids that, that dropped out of art when they were out of graduate school and they finally realized that they made a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, fortunately, I never made that mistake. Yeah, you stuck with it. I stuck with it and... And uh, did you know? And I, there were some hard times, and there were some great times, but I wouldn't trade any of it, you know, because I th I can look back over the, like the book that I did of fifty years of sculpture. Right look back then, I, I get tired looking at that. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of pieces. Yeah, yeah, because you can only do so many as a sculptor, and you're doing a lot of big pieces as well. Yeah, and I always preferred to pretty much work alone. Mm. It's nice to have somebody to help lift the other end of something once in a while but but when you're in that zone when you're creating and making stuff you don't want to have a lot of other outside people you have to be telling them don't do this or do mm -hmm. that or whatever yeah you have the vision and you know what you want yeah and you can see it or feel yeah it. and it's the vision that is the energy behind making you do it mm-hmm you know, I mean, if you you're carving your arms, you could be tired. But if you have this vision and you want to, you want to keep going, you know, keep going, keep mm -hmm. going, or 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 forging or whatever. Uh, yeah, you really wear yourself out. But you 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 love doing it. And there's there something you think you'll be known for in the in the future as in the art historian world. Nah. You don't think so? No. Well, you're in a lot of major I, I, museums. Yeah, but you know the art world is is gone way beyond wherever I where I, you know I'm going backwards. Yeah. Going back to traditional materials and and uh, techniques and stuff that you know from a hundred years ago or more. Well, maybe and, that's what you'll be remembered as, as you're doing things that <laughs> other people won't. Really, I mean, quite honestly. Well, yeah, I think. People are trying to make art too easy now. Uh, you know, they throw stuff together. And well, one thing that I'll probably be known for is that it lasted. Uh, a lot of stuff now is not going to last very long because mm -hmm. it's so poorly crafted or they use cheap materials or materials that won't weather very well. Yeah, and yours are made out of iron yeah, and, stuff, and granite stone. And, yeah. and even the woods are, you yeah, know, the woods are hardwoods and very hardwoods. Yeah. So maybe that's what I'd be known for. I don't know, maybe uh, kind of romantic nostalgia in some ways, the forms and stuff that 
that I use when I was doing the like old farm machinery and stuff mm -hmm. like that. The the uh, the sense of um, utilitarian form and function, mm -hmm. how usually really functional form is beautiful. I mean, you, you know, everything can be beautiful. There's just, and there's there's very little interest in the cutting edge of the art world in beauty. The, you know, beauty's, it's so common that I guess nobody wants to bother with it anymore because there's lots of things that are beautiful. I mean, you have to just look at the sunset or go out and look at the clouds and stuff mm -hmm. or the mountains or, you know, or, everything. Or a borchard sculpture. Or, or well, hopefully a sculpture yeah. that yeah. I do, yeah. yeah. Um, I look at one every day in front of my house. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. like that. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, So I don't know where the art world's going, but I, it's it's not someplace where I want to be. And why do you say that? Well, for one thing, I think art has been bastardized by by becoming art with an attitude, politicized and 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 taken beyond. Um, it has to have a message. It can't just be art for art's sake. Yeah, and and I mean, art art with a message can be fine mm -hmm. if it's good art. Mm -hmm. But the message doesn't validate the art. Mm -hmm. The art has to validate the message, mm. and it very rarely does. Mm. I mean, there's been some great historical artists who who did great political messages, satires, and whatever, mm -hmm. but you know, most of the crap that's being done now is crap. And what what would you say to young artists that are thinking about going into this field? Any advice that you would give them? Uh, well, I could say so. learn your craft. Mm -hmm. Really learn your craft. Learn your tools. Really learn your tools. Learn your materials. Find out what your materials can do and more important, what they shouldn't do mm. or they can't do. Um, be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't make art for the market. Make art for yourself. Yeah, I believe that for sure. Or, or you're 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 whoring it out. You know, it's not. It'll be hollow anyway. Yeah, well, probably, but most people can't tell the difference. <laughs> Some can't, it's true. So, same with writing. I would say, you know, if you have the calling, which I did and so some people do, there's nothing else you can do. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be happy unless you pursue that. Uh, and a guy who was the dean of the, of the Art Institute years ago said there's three things that make, uh, make an artist. The most common thing that people learn is, is talent. Lots of people are talent. The next thing that's that, that's important is to be able to sell yourself, to to be able to explain or verbalize what you're thinking and what you're thinking. You know, mm -hmm. Not that that has to necessarily be the only thing that makes your art, but he said the most important thing is tenacity yep I, I could have told you what it was yeah 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 you gotta you gotta stick with it and stick with it and stick with it and when you're in a garage in northbrook and you're freezing your butt off and you're trying to get your <laughs> torch lit and weld and you have, have these grit mittens on and you can't work it and stuff you just you just keep doing it yeah just do it you know because in the end it's it's you know may not be rich but you'll be able to look back and you said, I was true to myself and I did what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's good. Well, Fred, you have tenacity. I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I know. And keep making art for me. Yeah. I well. love, I get excited every time you bring in a piece. It's like Christmas for me because uh -huh. I know the effort that went into it. I also know there's, you know, you're do it. You're at that point in your career where each one 
is very important and maybe the last you don't know yeah and so i always uh, i'm thrilled every time i see you come in with something yeah, that's the stuff always i'm different. doing now is exploring stuff that's uh, really kind of intuitive and is not uh you know that's not work in a series yeah. where i'm exploring an idea and trying to push an envelope or something i'm kind of going back in my mind and looking in the crevices and under the rugs and stuff to see what's there yeah, well, then we got to see the next piece. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Soon, I hope. <laughs> All right, Fred Borchard, thank you for taking the time, my friend. You bet, you bet. I love your art. I love living with your art every day. I look at it in well, and out of my house both. It's, and, it's uh, wonderful to have a, a, a dealer that I know appreciates what I do. Oh, yeah, I love it. Damn few people do. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. I don't know how they deal. Well, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. That's, that's the world. Fred Borchard. Go look at his art on our website if you want. He has a great book of all the retrospective. You can also order on our website, which shows all the work that he's done. And we'll put a few paintings or a few uh, of the sculptures up on uh, the uh, podcast as well. Great. Fred Borchard. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. That was wonderful. Good. Well, that was fun. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.